and good morning, everyone. My name is Frank Reedy. I'm representing the Strategic Studies Department here at JSOP. Today, we're pleased to present a conversation with a distinguished guest, including audience Q and A. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSOP network. Keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. Since unsettled weather or other technical interruptions have a chance of occurring, if you lose connection, just rejoin the session. If the internet fails you, remember, you can always dial in. If you have feedback or questions after this session, email thinkjsow at socom.mil. Today's moderator is Mr. Jack Guy, a senior faculty here at JSOW. He will introduce the program and today's guest. Thank you, Frank. Good morning to everyone. My name is Jack Guy and I'm an adjunct instructor at the Joint Special Operations University uh, in Tampa, Florida. Thanks to the magic of modern technology, I'm currently sitting in sunny Columbus, Ohio. I want to welcome everyone uh, to another online interview of Think JSAO. Think JSAO is an ongoing series that explores research and publications of JSAO faculty, resident senior fellows, leading academics, and the wider SOF and international security community. The online collection includes interviews and conversations with authors and researchers and is intended to supplement existing publications, articles, and other active discussions. We encourage everyone to explore the complete Think JSOW collection by reviewing our online offerings on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the All Partner Access Network, or APAN. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Oscar Johnson, author of The Russian Understanding of War, Blurring the Lines Between War and Peace a volume you will find on the SOCOM Commander's reading list. Oscar Johnson is currently Academic Director for the Center for the Go Governance of Change at IE University in Segovia, Spain. He holds a PhD from the Department of War Studies at King's College in London, and he has earlier been Director of the Stockholm Free World Forum, a visiting researcher at UC Berkeley, and a subject matter expert at the Swedish Armed Forces Headquarters. Oscar has advised governments, armed forces, leadership, and financial institutions on strategic affairs and geo geopolitical risk, and has been featured in international print and broadcast media. Oscar, we thank you for joining us today. This presentation is timely given the re-energized topic of great power competition and the persistent interest we all have in Vladimir Putin, especially surrounding his current activities in and around Belarus. I suspect that these will become part of our discussion today. I know that you have a briefing prepared, so let, let us allow you to introduce your topic, and then we can open the door to questions uh, uh, to a Q&A for the remainder of the session. Let me just say to the audience, you can ask questions by clicking on the, the chat button at the bottom of the page. So, please, or the Q&A button on the bottom of the page. So Oscar, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much, Jack, and thank you very much, Frank. Um, I am very, very happy to be here, um, not only um, because it's fun to talk about my book, but rather because I think that the audience here is exactly the right one, and I think actually that you are among the most uh, suited to actually um, to understand um, and, and appreciate the arguments that I'm making. I think that that's one of the reasons why, um, as Jack said, uh, your commander had the kindness to put my book on the reading list. And uh, what the book is about is I set out starting reading a lot of Russian military theory about eight years ago. And I picked something up then that was very notable in the Russian discussions, but not very notable at all in the, in the Western discussions. So statements such as the boundaries of peace and war is blurring and that non-military means are becoming more important than military means today. So this is not the conclusion of the book. This is the starting point. This is really what I wanted to investigate to try and understand, well, why are they blurring and what is blurring them? And what does this mean 
for the way we're doing war today. So uh, first of all, let's start from the basics. Um, I think all of you have read your Clausewitz and, and so have the, the Soviets as well. So to really get to uh, the starting point to which we understand the essence of war, I went to Marxism, Leninism and War and Army, the, the authority book, and they said, the essence of war is the continuation of politics by the mean of armed force. The essence of war does not include many of the other ways to uh, secure victory. So we're starting by armed force, armed violence at the core of the concept of what war consists of. Fast forward, um, normally it's always fun to ask you to raise your hands to see how many who knows, knows the people, um, but I can't do that. So the guy on the left uh, is Mahmoud Garayev, who was um, the deputy uh, chief of general staff during his active career, but he was then the president of uh, the Academy of Military Sciences up until I think December, January this year when he passed away. Uh, continued to contribute to Russian military theory for a long time. And he said, stated in 2005, it was very representative of what Russian military theorists were saying about war. He said, without the use of military force, war has never been and never can be. However, something happened. All of a sudden, fast forward, the same Garayev said um, only 11 years later, he said, the definition of the essence of war must, to some extent, be reviewed. The threat is connected with information and other subversive actions, the creation of controlled chaos, which I will uh, which I use synonymously with color revolutions, which is the concept I will use. These are done to provoke unrest, to overthrow undesirable power structures from within, violate internal stability. We've seen it in Iraq, we've seen it in Libya, we've seen it in Ukraine. Another example, this guy you all know, he said, color revolutions are the main means of achieving their political ambitions. 2014, this is Chief of General Staff, um, Gerasimov. He said, it's obvious that the line between peace and war is blurring and that non-military forms and means of struggle has received an unprecedented technological development and a violent nature in itself. So non-military means are becoming violent. Third and last example of, um, you know, just cutouts of the Russian military debate and seeing what's changing is the guy on the right, Deputy Defense Minister um, Kartapolo, Kartapolo. He stated, the classical war of the 20th century usually consists of 20% violence and 80% violence and 20% propaganda. New types of war uh, is the reverse, 80 to 90% propaganda and 10 to 20% violence. So all of this is just to give you an overview, kind of what's the shift. And now let's try to um, think a little bit of what this means. You might be aware of this one and you're not meant to be able to, to read all of it. The only thing um, I wanted to point out is, well, two things. This has been popularly known as the Gerasimov Doctrine. This is you know, from a speech he gave in January 2013, which really become, became sensationalized in the West um, after the invasion of Ukraine, honestly, because it was the only article that, that most Western analysts had read and was readily available. And this is really a graph that he used. And I think the, the thing you should look at is just the one in the middle bottom, which is saying that uh, the correlation of non-military means to military is four to one. That is to say, non-military means are four times as important as military. You know, this is a set of escalation of how modern war looks. Okay, so what does this mean? I think this is, um, for me, I think this is the easiest and, and best overview of the way uh, in which we, uh, Russian military theorist thinks about modern war. In the first place, um, West will try to use non-military means, color revolutions, to force uh, a regime change. I will talk a little bit more about what and how they are, but they are seen as a combination of information influence, uh, intelligence services, political support, diplomatic support, basically that us in the West have been so successful that we managed to brainwash uh, populations to overthrow their own rulers. Um, they started with the color revolutions in, in Georgia 2003, in Ukraine 2004, and Kyrgyzstan 2005, um, but then expanded to be included into the Arab Spring, to of course Ukraine 2013-2014, and as if you follow current news today, this is exactly what um, Russian strategies are seeing happening in Belarus while we speak. If this doesn't work, then uh, 
us, the West, would escalate and use special, uh, special operations forces, support armed opposition, application of private military companies, the concealed use of force. We can take examples, I'm sure you're all aware of the, the early stages of the, the, the intervention in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, um, Syria, for instance. If this doesn't work, as the West would escalate even further, we will search for pretext to launch a military operation. Um, you can call it humanitarian intervention, you can call it, or as the mandate said in Libya, protecting civilians, and then we would come with an open military influence. And all of this, of course, boils down to getting our political objectives on the opposing states. That's the, um, that's the arrows down there. Okay, so why are, color revolution seen as so important? Why are they the primary means of West to achieve their political goals? And I'm not going to go into all of these details, but I have to look at Russian modern history and understand that what we see today as a great power being assertive in the international state, interfering in elections, has not always been the case. Rather, conversely, um, Russian modern history has been one of state fragility. 89, 91, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the immense unrest. You had a, a coup attempt in 91, the August Putsch. Between 92 and 99, the Russian Federation was de facto not in control of its own territory. And I'm talking about Chechnya here. And can you imagine just a thought experiment of the United States not controlling parts of its own territory because you had a, a separatist movement or, or France not controlling, you know, the Bordeaux region. That's um, that's how weak Russia was, and that's how fearful they were for uh, more internal unrest. Um, 93, um, you, as you see in the picture behind, this is uh, a political standoff between Yeltsin and the Speaker of the Duma, Khaspulatov, a Chechen, coincidentally, which led to Yeltsin bombing his own parliament. Um, 98, 99, you had a significant economic crisis. 99, 2000, you had the Second Chechen War. 2005, um, you had the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. You had a lot of the protest leaders from the Russian opposition in Ukraine at Maidan, then going to Russia, trying to, um, to make the same kind of way. So the point here being is that, actually, I would argue one of the biggest threats, what worries you the most if you're sitting in the Kremlin and you're looking out at the world, is it, you know, is it NATO military forces? Do you think that NATO will attack? I would argue that a decent Russian intelligence analyst will quite quickly figure out that NATO does not have the posture, the intention, the interest, the plans of invading Russia, even though that's, you know, there's a lot of talk about that. Rather, every day you have the legitimacy of the regime challenge from within, but also as this picture shows, and this picture is taken from one of Gerasimov's presentations, the, the closest states to Russia, its biggest geopolitical setbacks has come from so color revolutions. What this picture illustrates is red is successful color, color revolutions and yellow are attempted color revolutions. And this is really where the West has trying to engineer these kind of coups. And the interesting part now is that they would add a uh, Belarus 2020 with a question mark. Um, you can also see a sloppy staff officer has missed uh, to, to have maintained the Cyrillic from Kuwait down there. But this is, this is Gerasimov's own maps. And you can also notice, of course, how the Arab Spring went from seeing spontaneous events, you can look at the official Russian statement when they, when they started happen, to soon thereafter seeing as a purposeful warfare by the West uh, to force through these changes. And this, of course, is a bit um, disregarding facts such as, in many of these cases, there were no interests from, from the West to, to provoke these coups. The other part, which has um, really contributed to this blurring uh, of the blurring of the boundaries between peace and war is information warfare. This is something that's always been very close to heart to Russian theorists. But it has really, really picked up, um, especially from 2012, 2013. To give you one example, um, Putin stated uh, in one of his programmatic speeches that new types of weapons and information warfare will be as effective as nuclear weapons, but more acceptable from a political and military point of view. 
you know, Arsenal stated 2017 that Western countries are increasing the scale of a tough information war unleashed against Russia. And this is not only rhetorics. If you look at the polls in 2017, Lavada poll said that actually 69% of the Russian population believe that an information war was ongoing. Okay, well, why is information warfare this important then? First of all, I recommend all of you who are interested in Russia to read um, First Person, which is a book written by a journalist when Putin was completely unknown. And a lot of the modern trying to get in Putin's head type of studies often have this as the primary source because he was completely unknown and he was, um, you know, he was kind of run for president in February 2000 and he needed to get known. So he published his book and one of the things um, he says in there is, you know, we lost the first Chechen war due to lack of morale. Um, so one of, one of the, the morale was already low from the start. It was an unpopular war, but uh, morale among the troops were, were, were horrible. Um, and this is something that uh, was uh, worked with very purposefully to the second Chechen war. You had psychologists in the units. You had, uh, in the first Chechen war, you had Russian journalists who were free to report. They could travel down into Chechnya get expenses from the warlords for their travels, go back to Moscow and write rep, uh, reporting that was very critical to the war, which contributed to the unpopularity. For the second Chechen war, only embedded journalists were allowed. Uh, what was being broadcast about the war was, was strictly controlled. Uh, psychologists were out there with the troops to monitor the morale. Another example of how uh, firmly um, the role of media uh, relates to power in Russia can be taken from the 96 election, the re-election of Yeltsin. In 95, the year before, he was trailing in the polls. He was only the fifth most popular candidate. Um, the most popular one was uh, Shuganov, the, the communist leader. So a number of powerful oligarchs got together and they were like, hey, we, we tried this communism thing before and it didn't really seem to work out for us. We need to do something. So within the span of a very short amount of time, all of the newspapers started uh, publishing a lot of uh, kompromat, compromising material on Zyuganov and started um, promoting Yeltsin. And Yeltsin managed to turn the polls around to secure a narrow margin in victory. And why is this important? Well, because the first thing that Putin did when he came to power, um, actually he started, he started very cautiously. That was, if you read the analysis from when he started, everyone is very, he said he was cautious, he didn't want to make enemies, but he did one thing in particular. He took over the media stations of Boris Beresovsky and Vladimir Gusinsky and drove them out of the country. If you're interested in Beresovsky, you know, he took a very suspicious suicide in London. He protected Litvinenko, who you know was poisoned by polonium. Uh, that's another story. But that really shows uh, the intrinsic relation between media and power that was already there from the beginning. Another example in the Second Session War, as I said, Russian armed forces really updated their media approach. However, what they missed was the internet. Um, Chechen fighters relied on the internet to, um, you know, to find recruits, to organize funding, to spread propaganda of their deeds. And uh, between the Chechen Wars, it really transformed from a national separatist struggle to global jihadi struggle. So if you were a jihadi in 99, 2000, you went to Chechnya. It was basically like ISIS in, in, in Syria. Um, fast forward a little bit. In the Georgian war in 2008, uh, Russian strategist looked between himself and said something like, but hey, we managed to get the Georgians to shoot first. Why is international media so angry with us? Uh, why did we lose the, the global media battle? And they made a quick analysis and said, hey, we're not, you know, we're not pressing, it's CNN, it's BBC. So it was after that, that um, funding for RT, Russia Today, was significantly increased, that they opened in, in Arabic, in French, in Spanish, they opened RT US, RT UK. They realized we really need to get into the international media domain because that's where perceptions of legitimacy, perceptions of, of, um, of power lies. Um, you know, same thing Arab Spring. Uh, conventional wisdom suggests that Arab Spring is a social media created uprising. And uh, that was causing, that caught all of these um, authoritarian uh, rulers off guard. Arab Spring spilled over to Russia and you had the Russian winter. We have some of the most, some of the largest uh, protests in, in 
since the end of the Soviet Union at the Russian parliamentary presidential election. Maybe you remember the Bolotnaya protest. After that, that's when the first recorded uh, existence of the, the troll factory came, 2013. And it was not you know, promoting that the West was decadent or so, but it was rather used for um, the 2013 mayoral election in Russia, saying Navalny, who coincidentally is poisoned by Novichok now, um, is bad and Sobyanin, the, the, the pro-Kremlin candidate, was good. That was the first kind of known task of the, the, the troll factory. Then, after um, the invasion of Ukraine, that's when it started uh, going a bit more international and global. I think you're getting kind of the red thread that I want to get to here is that uh, it's it's quite a pragmatic way of trying to understand and seeing, hey, this is what happened. We are losing. Uh, the media domain is important, but we're not getting through. We need to update our ways of, of handling and promoting our narratives there. Um, this was particularly obvious in, in the invasion of Ukraine. And after that, you also see a wide range of legislative tools, such in Russia. I mean, widening the definition of what is classified as extremism, including liking a Facebook post, um, including retweeting something. This could be uh, enough for a criminal charge. Driving the founder of Ekontaktia, the Russian Facebook, out of the country and taking control of that. Um, Influence on the US election, I think probably you know quite a lot. I will just raise one story, which I find the most interesting one. And that's uh, the Instagram account of, of, of Blackstagram. So there's quite an academic debate on how effective has Russian influence uh, election been or not. Um, but one of the things that was published uh, along with, the, at the same time as the Mueller report, were a number of uh, troll factory Instagram accounts. And, most of them were insignificant, a couple of thousand followers, but one of the largest ones were Blackstagram. And let's say 95% of the contents was legitimate civil rights types of question uh, for black people, uh, together with you know, your average influencer content. I don't really know what influencers does, but things like, hey, you're strong today, um, you know, don't take any shit, or I don't know. But 5% of that was, was very, very targeted um, communication saying, um, you know, don't go and vote, you know, your vote doesn't count, it's a hoax, the whole election, Hillary is not your candidate. Like that was the strategic goals that was promoted by this account. Um, and this, of course, ties into the conventional wisdom that Obama won because of he managed to, to uh, mobilize the black vote. And this, um, you can see Graphica Facebook revelations are seeing exactly the same uh, pattern for the 2020 elections with I Instagram accounts before uh, Biden won the primary saying, hey, all of them were anti-Biden. That was the main focus um, from the beginning. I'll move on a little bit quickly. Okay, so these are the two strands which are really seem to be changing the way Russian military theorists are understanding war. And this is, uh, you know, I have the, theoretical and more practical arguments in the book. And the theoretical argument in the book is really the way in which these are seen such important, such consequential, more important than military means, means that today we cannot say that the Russian understanding of what war is, the nature of war, is solely defined by armed force. I'm saying that these uh, non-military means are expanding that. Okay. So um, since we're, um, since I know we're having some very, very clever people in the audience, I will um, help you by, by uh, raising a bit of your um, counter arguments. And then someone of you would say, well, sure, but you're only given a few loose quotes. And, and I would say, no, not really. I, I counted actually, and I go through the works of around 140, 150 Russian military theorists in the books. But then someone else would say, sure, but Russia is spending so much on the military. And I would say, absolutely. I don't think anything that I'm saying in this presentation is going against that, that the military instrument of power is still seen as, as uh, ex, you know, existential, of existential importance um, for Russia. Uh, rather, I would say that the strong military power is a foundation for its uh, very offensive use of non-military means. And then someone who studied, you know, some Russian studies would say something like, well, sure, but, you know, Russian strategic culture has always been a wider notion of what constitutes conflict. 
And I would say, yeah, sure. I think, you know, a, a British researcher put it as the normal um, for the West is peace and, and the exception is war, whereas the, the normal for Russians is, is war and, and peace is only a theoretical, um, you know, interruption of, of hostilities that the struggle and war is, is, is omnipresent. I think that has some merit, that argument, but what I show in the book is really how the whole center of debate, the debate in Russia shifted uh, to give, uh, to having these ideas first as fringe ideas, to really have the most senior, the most powerful people saying, this is how we understand modern war. Uh, lastly, if someone is really, really clever in the audience, you guys would say, uh, sure, but the military only says that it fears those things. And I think this is a really good question. I mean, it's a paradox in itself. Why would the military, the armed forces in Russia, who's responsible for external military violence, say that the biggest threats are internal and non-military? And my hypothesis, which I put forward a little bit on the book, is really that I think they understood that this is so important for the political elite that they cannot afford to be seen sleeping uh, on this. So they might say, you know, this is, uh, you know, color revolution is the biggest threats. Give us money, we'll buy ballistic missiles. Maybe. Okay, conclusions. My argument is that the Russian understanding of war is a very non-sentimental impact assessment. They're seeing, okay, power is formed in, in media. Okay, well, we need to build international media channels. Power is formed on social media. Okay, we need to uh, diminish the opportunities for our adversary to impact us in social media and to go on the offensive there. We see that um, the promise of liberal democracy is super powerful. Okay, we need to diminish the attractiveness of liberal democracy and start uh, down talking that. Then there's always a question is, well, is this, you know, does the Russian leaders say this or, um, you know, is it, is it just empty words or do they believe it? I think they absolutely believe it. And just one example is how, you know, Western policymakers say that the sanctions on Russia, um, may, maybe Russia won't collapse, but it can be uncomfortable enough for Putin's elite, so they force him out of office. And maybe that's a fair argument. I think probably not. But what we are actually saying is that with our sanctions, we are uh, aiming for regime change in Russia. Um, some people are saying that, you know, straight up. Another example is how in the oil crisis 2014, when the, when the oil price went down, um, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia refused to cut production on, on oil to raise the price again. Uh, and Putin is on, on the record saying, you know, Saudi Arabia is the US, um, yeah, I don't know the word, but U.S. ally, and they're trying to they're trying to break us, um, and they're seeing you know some some kernel of truth, but they're also seeing in a very conspiratorial way of saying this is not just Saudi Arabia wants to have a bigger share of the oil market, but this is rather them trying to break us and force a civil war. Third conclusion <clears throat> is that what we see Russia is successful in doing is very much also taking this non-sentimental impact assessment and saying, okay, we're influenced by, you know, the, th the promise of liberal democracy. Okay, you know, how can we counter that? You know, what is our alternative? Um, and what are the weaknesses uh, in the other way? Um, so first, you know, the, chronolo the chronology is not perfect, but saying first they perceive themselves to be losing and then they feel like, okay, how can we use this offensively? Um, last slide. Okay, what, what does this mean? Well, from Russian strategy's point of view, they've launched a strategic deterrence and subversion operation. I don't think this is very controversial to say. The strategic deterrence is mostly um, focused on military means and military movements. Strategic subversion operation, uh, we see especially towards in election integrity. And if you want in the Q&A, we can discuss how effective that is and not. Our hopes of de-escalation is most often misplaced and unlikely to produce a lasting de-escalation. Um, and I think this is, I would argue that Russian offensive action is premised on the idea that us in the West are very predictable and will always want to negotiate our way out of a conflict because it's uncomfortable. Take one example, Sergei Lavrov at, at the invasion of Ukraine said, um, 
you guys are very angry now, but you will forget about this in six months, which is exactly what happened in Georgia. Uh, you had the reset after six months. And I think that he would have been 100% correct um, because we would have up until, uh, if it not had been for the accidental downing of MH17, um, which killed a lot of, especially Dutch uh, and some British, up until that point, you only had very, very symbolic sanctions on symbolic figures in the Russian regime, such as Surkov, Rogozin, you know, travel sanctions and such. It was only after the accidental downing of that airplane, you actually started having sectoral sanctions, which were not super strong in themselves. And another, another reason why I say I think Russia is right is that, you know, you just look at uh, the French president Macron, uh, it was about a year ago, he said, hey, we need to, we need to start cooperating with Russia again. Uh, you know, this conflict is bad. Even though since that time, you had the use of chemical, uh, chemical weapons, Novichok on, on NATO territory in the UK, and a whole range of other things and nothing, you know, compliance with the Minsk uh, Accords in Ukraine. Uh, so last point that I will raise is our, you know, our primary problem is not, you know, it's not about attribution that, that you know, Russia has found such clever tools of warfare that we have no idea what's going on and who's doing what. I mean, look at the Mueller report and, you know, the sanctioning of individual GRU officers means that we actually know what's going on. I mean, Obama knew what was the election interference that was going on in 2016, but he was unsuccessful in, you know, credibly transmitting and saying, you know what you're doing, you need to stop that or else. Um, we also, I mean, attribution is also, it's not immediate, but it's very doable, especially if you have an asset in the Russian presidential administration that knows what Putin signs off or not. If you remember the story about a year ago. Our primarily problem is not that Russia is so technologically savvy that we have no idea to, to, to counter it. It's not a legal problem either. And maybe you'll hear that, that there's a, there's a big gray zone between war and peace, uh, which we cannot operate. Actually, I'll, I'll give you the, the very short answer. I'm not an expert in US legislation, but in Sweden, Actually, the, the legislation in place is very much sufficient. It's just about political will of declaring what is happening and, and, and using the tools uh, than necessary. Our primary problem is about deterrence. We know that these events are going on, but we cannot in a credible way saying stop this or else. And I think that that's, that's where I'll end because I'm more interested in hearing uh, your questions. You know, um, if there's anything you want to ask me, there's my email, uh, there's my webpage with a lot of other things I've written. Fantastic discount for the book if you use that code. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll pass it over to Guy, uh, to Jack, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what kind of, you know, what you have in your mind. Good. Thank you, Oscar. That was, that was very interesting. Uh, we're already ginning up a number of questions, but the first thing I'd like to ask just in general is, and you make this point in the book, uh, how serious is what, what you viewed as a decline uh, in the West of, of study and understanding of the Russians? Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think that's, that's, I mean, one of the things I didn't spell it out um, right, but I'll do it now is that Actually, I think that in a lot of ways in my book, I'm, I rather think that Russian military theories are better at grasping what's going on today um, because for a number of reasons, they have a very, you know, they have a very rich military theoretical tradition. They have a philosophical holistic way of approaching these issues. And, a very, and I think sometimes we in the West is very, you know, blinded by our assumptions of, you know, this is how we think that things should be. This is, what's pairing war and I mean it's also a contradiction sometimes between liberal democracies and, and pairing war. Um, so I think that a lot of what I'm saying is actually I think that that Russian theorists are have, have figured out in a in a, in a good way. We we really stopped uh, studying Russia for a long time and I mean I, I remember I was I was brought to the to the British cabinet very quickly in 2014 and the only people in the room was me and uh, people around the, the you know, border of, of retirement. And it was really very little in between. I mean, scholars that was, you know, in their, in the 40s or, or, or such. 
because during that time it was really you know the old Soviet ones and the, the people have started starting Russian more lately. So I think that's a big problem because I think a lot of what what Russia is doing is not you know it's not uh, you know if you understand the, the premises and the drivers it's not it's not you know it's not a confusion you know Putin said himself if you recognize Kosovo we'll we'll recognize South Ossetia and Abkhazia and then a half year later you have the Georgian War so I think it's uh, you know it's, I, th I think it really it really hinders our understanding um, sadly. Let me ask, and this is from one of our participants, what is the difference uh, between the, the traditional active measures and this new Russian uh, methodology within the information environment? I, I, I don't think there's any difference. I think that it, it's rather continuation and adoption of, um, as I said before, I think Russian military theorists has always thought a lot about the, the psychological aspect of war. And I mean, strategy is operating on the minds of your adversary. It's, it's, never, about, um, it's never about, you know, just about tanks. It's about, uh, and I mean, uh, I think here at Yesau, you're probably more inclined to, to, to agree with this, but uh, I mean, take Afghanistan as, a, as an instance. I've served myself in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, you you cannot just add tanks and, and hope to solve a military problem. It's a, you know, it's a it's a psychological, it's a, it's a societal, it's a, you know, strategy is always it's always a, it's always a battle of wills. And I think we lost that a little bit, and especially in the U.S., when you have you know the immense superiority uh, to so uh, the answer to military problem has always been add more force. Uh, and that can work up until a point um, that I think we lost, and that's we, the collective West, lost a little bit of that aspect of strategy. And I think active measures really puts that at its core. And I think it's just an adoption to, I mean, today, so much of how we perceive power, legitimacy, and influence is determined by uh, a few number of algorithms and a few number of tech companies. Of course, Russian strategies are gonna be there what in the business sense is called search engine optimization. How do you make your things visible? Um, and there's a Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund in DC had, had made you know, very good points on this, looking at YouTube, just um, you know, Googling Syria chemical weapons. Top seven, seven of 10 results was, was you know, RT conspiracy theories that it was the West who was uh, using gas in Syria. Um, and now I think last time I talked to them, they said that Google uh, or YouTube had updated their, their algorithms to, to, you know, not play RT and such. But um, so short answer, it's, it's about an adoption to, you know, how society is changing rather than revolutionizing, you know, war or, or the underlying concepts. Do you see a connection be, uh, with the Rus this uh, current Russian methodology uh, as mirroring some of the work that in the Chinese study, unrestricted warfare. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think unrestricted warfare is 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 also. Uh, I mean, it was written at the time when a lot of Russian military uh, theory underlying today was written from a, a lot significantly weaker position. Really trying to to think in a very pragmatic way. You know, how do we influence uh, uh, someone who is, uh, in power terms, notably superior? Um, and I think that's, that's really, if you scale away all of the kind of legal, organizational, cultural ways of looking at war as we, you know, we're thinking of the loss of war, we're thinking of um, international law a lot. If you just take them away and you think of war, conflict, battle, how do I, you know, maximize my influence through my limited position? I think you will come up to a lot of these answers. So it's, it's, it's not... It's not that revolutionary. It's it's rather about understanding, you know, you, you cannot afford to lose. How do you make the most of it, what you have? Um, Thanks. Uh, another question at, looks at the post-1991 Russian immigration that took place and asks, how did this facilitate, do you think, uh, Russian information warfare and its non- conventional threats waged by the Russians against NATO. Do you see any connection there? By the fact that a lot of Russians went for the West. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not really sh sure. I mean, theoretically, it would have you know increased opportunities for legalists, which I think. I mean, has. I mean, we haven't talked about Russian intelligence services, who has been a very very long term perspective, very active. You you building up networks. And I guess a lot of, you know, you could have people bringing knowledge back, uh, of course, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have a good answer. So I'll, I'll... We give a, we pay a lot of attention uh, to uh, the Russian uh, activities vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Uh, what do you see as Russia's ambitions in the Pacific and, and toward China? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I don't think they have, you know, super big uh, ambitions. I think rather they, they're also perceiving themselves to be a losing end, I mean, for, for economic reasons, for demographic reasons. And if you look at, you know, the, the sources of Russian power, there's not that much that, that happens in the Far East. Um, so rather, I think that they are, uh, I mean, you know, the, the people, the economic activity um, are, are, are concentrated in the West. So I don't think they have very, you know, ambitious goals there. And when it comes to China, I think that uh, you, you'll see, you'll see articles suggesting that there's a big alliance going on, and I, I, I don't think that's that's the case at all. It's rather about um, Russia is afraid of China, of course. I mean, you have Chinese economic penetration in all of Central Asia and, and parts of Russia as well, and and you don't have the basis for for genuine partnership. I think that if you want to use the term allies, um, my thought experiment is really this: you know, would Russia sacrifice something for China to gain it, um, and my ar argument is probably no. And then it's just a you know a marriage of convenience. If you look at the big uh, gas deal that was done 2015, which was taunted at oh now you know Russia and China is moving closer, it was something that had been discussed for for a decade, and it only went through because you know Russia lowered the price a lot. So I think there's a lot of fuss about uh, you know Russia and China, and I think there's a lot of Russian right there. I mean, it's the same in Europe. Look at Chinese uh, economic penetration in, in, in Europe. It's, you know, it's significant. You have certain countries like China owns 90% of telecom infrastructure in Portugal. And all of a sudden, Portugal starts vetoing uh, human rights resolutions in, in, in the European Parliament and the European Commission and the Council. So I think that, that that's probably a bit similar situation to where we are. And I mean, Huawei is going to build the 5G in Russia and not necessarily because Russia feel that that's a good idea, but, you know, they don't have that much to choose from. So you think that, that perhaps uh, rather than picking up the Kremlin playbook, that the Chinese would continue along this economic road? I think, I think uh, roughly I would describe, uh, you know, Russian power is, is quite limited. It's a power to destroy and disrupt. And I think that's almost the best Russia can hope for. I mean, who, which genuine allies does Russia have in the world? Who, you know, would gladly stand and fight with Russia? Very few places. And I mean, you know, Ukraine, uh, they, you know, they, they invaded Ukraine and had the most, you know, anti-Russian feeling in Ukraine in, in forever, which has been the key partner. The other one is Belarus, uh, which is now also forced by necessity uh, closer to Russia. But as, I mean, Belarus criticized Russia for invading Ukraine. Um, and that's not also, I mean, it's, it's more of a cost and more of a drag than, than a genuine partnership. Chinese power, on the, the other hand, is, is uh, I, I would say like this, I mean, R R Russia is, is screaming a lot louder than it has tools to. Um, China is, is screaming quieter than it has economic influence. So economic influence and general influence went first. And then now they kind of start to realize how strong they are and how much they can use. So it's really um, two different kinds of power. And I mean, Russian power is destroy and disrupt, which is not an insignificant amount of power. Um, and I think they're doing, I think given their position, they're getting a lot of, um, you know, a lot of return on their investments to destroy and disrupt. Whereas the Chinese one is, is so much stronger because it, um, it, it's, it's more of a, you know, more of influence and building and purchasing. Uh -huh. Uh, we have a question that, that asks uh, if you could explain the role of the 2016 Yaravaya law and how it plays with 
Russian strategy. Yeah, no, and I think I think it I think it plays exactly um, what I was saying about um, um, pragmatism in the internet domain. Um, that was a law who who, uh, who who really took that further in in, in restricting ways of um, increasing control and restricting ways of influence in, in the information domain. Um, so it. it it really just fits with that kind of pragmatic way of seeing, hey, this is the domain we're hurting in, um, and we need to update us. And I think that if you look at the Russian media landscape, uh, it's been very, very heavily focused on TV for a long time, and the internet has been relatively free. That is actually changing uh, much, much significantly, much slow, much more slower than, than it did in, in Europe. Um, but now they realize that they need to adopt it. And then just one example is that they're forcing all, this is not sp spoken about a lot, they're forcing all the big um, you know, tech companies to put their physical servers in Russia, uh, which the big tech companies are complying with. This means that it's connected to the SORM2 uh, surveillance network, which FSB you know, plugs in and, and sees all the activity into it. Um, this is another way of, of, of trying to get control of that, that space and that sphere. Uh -huh. We have a, a question that, that asks generally uh, if the comments of people like uh, Garyev and Gerasimov aren't just Maskirovka uh, to disguise the fact that Russia has been, been conducting this kind of non-conventional warfare uh, for decades and that they've also done it not only through the information space and information environment, but also through organized crime, drugs, terrorism, and so forth. Uh, with, with, uh, with I, I suspect, an, uh, a modest amount of disinformation and a lot of coordination internally. Yeah. No, I think, I, I think they're not. I mean, these are, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you go through the Russian military theoretical debate, you see that, like, it's, it's a vivid debate, like the one that's in the U.S., how should we understand war today? And this is, you know, this, these are not... These are meant to be put in a, you know, in a in, in a military university for classroom discussions rather than this is the big statements they're going to pick up in the West. And I think there's such a coherence in the. And I mean, you you see the evolution in my book if you read it. But like you see, this started like in the early 2000s all the way up to there. And I think is to try and orchestrate a, a false military theoretical debate with you know with thousands of participants for decades. Um, for a very kind of dubious um, gain, I think I, it's like it's too vast for, for for me to even think. I mean, even even when it comes to Russia, um, and I think it's. I mean, honestly, the, the things that that I kind of mentioned and gave as example is actually how Western military leaders have started sounding the last years as well. I mean, you, you see that now the, the UK chief of staff, uh, chief of joint general staff, defense staff. It's the call in the UK said the same, you know, boundaries between war and peace is blurring and, uh, you know, cyber activity are so, so intense that it cannot be considered peace and such. So I think it's a genuine military debate that we're looking at. Um, and I think in the rule of thumb is, you know, political statements uh, has a lot more of that kind of how is this being understood um, angle to it. You know, I think this goes along with, with the previous question, though, and, and, and comment that you made. If, if the West doesn't understand how the, the Russians see what is going on, for example, do they, do they now see that these so-called color revolutions or sanctions that they might place against them are in fact warfare? When we see it in the West as, as a way to, to uh, send a message to the Russians that we're not pleased with what they're doing. Yeah, no, and I think I think we are. I think we're very, very. I think we we fail quite badly in that regard because I mean, for us, the sanctions are really a way to avoid war. I mean, we do sanction because we don't want to do anything stronger. It's it's you know it's the available tool to respond to things. Um, and if you look at the sanctions we did first, uh, you know, the very symbolic one before the MH17s, you see that this is really. A way for us to 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 get away um, from from doing something bigger. I mean, let me take one example. 
you know, the, the innovation about the little green men, as, as the special forces were derogatively called, was not that they took off the patch and say, ha ha, you have no idea who we are. Uh, the innovation was rather that Russia went in there and they said, we know that you guys, the West, don't want to do anything. We're going to give you an opportunity uh, to pretend like you don't know what's happening. Um, and that was a good read. So for a couple of days there, we was like, oh, we don't know who, this, who these green men are. Um, and then when it turned out to be Russian, it was basically too late to start you know, doing something for, for control of Crimea. So the innovation was rather one of um, you know, saying, hey, we know that you don't want this. We're going to give you a way out to act like it's raining um, because we know that you don't have the determination. So um, I think that's, you know, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Uh, it goes, it seems that uh, Russia, the Russian new generation warfare is successful when the objectives are limited and the population influenced is already largely pro-Russian. Uh, would the doctrine have any success against non-Russian populations? Mm. Okay. I, I, and we're not talking about the American election. Yeah, okay. So I think, first of all, the, the new generation warfare term, I think has been fundamentally misunderstood. Um, I, I, I outlined that in the book, and you see that the person introducing the terms is building on the work of Vladimir Slipchenko, who um, was talking a lot about uh, contactless warfare, uh, and this is still, and a lot of Russian military thought today still boils back down to, to the Gulf War. They saw uh, a US military, which was numerically inferior, really uh, completely wipe out the Iraqi army, who was numerically superior, fundamentally built on Soviet material and Soviet doctrines. And this scared the shit out of Russian military theorists. And all the, already since the early 90s, this has been something that they've been grappling about. So what, what happened? C4 ISR complex, command, control, computers, communications, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and long distance weaponry. Because of these capabilities used in a new way, you saw what was then called in the West, the revolution military affairs, they saw that the West was so uh, effective that they managed to wipe out the Iraqis. This was what Slichenko was writing about. Um, he called it sixth generation warfare. He called it the contactless warfare. And the key authors, Shekinov and Bogdanov, you can see their writing already together with Slichenko already from the early 2000s. They were fundamentally concerned about how does long, long range precision weaponry change warfare uh, and the uh, information processing systems, basically, you know, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. And this, this, this was what they were talking about, even though they added a little flavor talking about information psychological operations. But it, their, their primary occupation was always uh, actually the, the, the military application of, of the, you know, information and communication systems. That being said, what we kind of uh, talking about now, probably best known, you know, hybrid warfare, but you can call it political warfare, et cetera. Honestly, I think, I think that the ethnic Russian aspect of it has been, has been very, very uh, overemphasized because, uh, and the best description of Russian strategy, I think comes from Mike Kaufman, who is, you know, he's a very clever guy. You should read everything he writes. I think um, he wrote something like fail fast, fail cheap, which is a very Silicon Valley innovative startup way of, of, of trying things. So you try out a whole range of things and then they see what sticks and then they double down on those efforts. So you just take the late, last revelations on, on peace data, which was a, a front for, well, we, we were supposed to front for the troll factory, but was working to influence uh, leftist, uh, peace activist leaning kind of newspaper. You know, they, they try everything. You know, they try the alt right. They try the they try the they try the left. They try the center. They try. You know, you can see who the political parties and came observe the elections in Crimea was a mix of you know communists in Europe, fascist, uh, you know, uh, Front National, um, basically trying everything where it sticks. And it doesn't really matter if um, you know if it's ideologically coherent with what the Kremlin is trying to do or not. So I think that uh, success um, is not only, I mean, it, it's definitely hard to incorporate the territory of Russia that does not want to be a part of Russia, say the Baltic states. 
Um, but I think that uh, I don't, you know, honestly, I think Russian strategies doesn't care that much who are running their errands. They'll try anyone who will do it, even if it's, you know, organized crime, if, it, if, if it's criminal groupings, uh, you know, freelance cyber hackers that one day hack Russia, the other day hack others. So I think it's, long story short, I think it's very pragmatic. And this is just to add another point on that. And I think that this is, you will always get into debate like are Russia geniuses or are they they're losers? Because sometimes they fail, such as in Dutch when they're sitting in a van and trying to hack into the OPCW. Um, or, and sometimes they succeed and we think they're the most clever ever. Honestly, I think this is quite irrelevant. What you really need to understand rather is they're super proactive to try, you know, 50 different things and five might fail completely and look silly uh, and five might, five might succeed fantastically and you, you think they're super clever. So rather than the dichotomy, are Russians good or bad, is actually they're hyperactive and try to work in a lot of different uh, domains. Right. Right. Have, have you had a chance to compare uh, Russian doctrine these days with Chinese doctrine in terms of how they are operating in this space? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stay away a little bit from that. I think I think what I said on the kind of there are similarities to kind of the I've only read the major writings coming out of China like the Unrestricted Warfare and other ones, and I think there are very much similarities. But I'm I'm not well versed enough in let's say Chinese strategic culture and operations to to give um, to give a good one. I mean, obviously China has been watching a lot what's going on, and you know they they also have their own troll factories and their hacker farms, etc. But but I'll, I'll, I'll back away from that one. Let me ask a general question from one of our attendees. Uh, when you look at, at where the Russian indirect action persists and, and you look at the way NATO, the US and NATO deal with that, do you think that, that there, is, there is within the gray area uh, competition space uh, activities that, that can be conducted that would, that would hinder uh, or deter the Russians uh, in, in terms of future actions? Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I, I ended on a very big note saying, hey, we, we, we're very bad at doing deterrence. And then um, I often get, you know, the, 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 the clever reply, okay, how do we do deterrence? So uh, the, the tricky part with deterrence is that um, you can deter things that is super important to you. You can probably deter quite well, such as let's not get invaded. Um, is it reasonable to assume that we can deter Russia from telling a lie, producing a false story, using, you know, RT in, in, in Serbia to tell, uh, frame stories that the West is evil? Um, no, I don't, I don't think that's, you know, I don't think it's reasonable. I don't think it's um, realistic and I don't think it's doable. Um, I mean, one of the reasons for, for Russian success in Ukraine is that it's, it's, I mean, war is a, is a battle of determination. The one who, for, I mean, it's seen as existential of importance for Russia, whereas for us it's more, yeah, it's a theoretical problem because we believe in international law and, and, and the Ukrainians are saying they want to be more West, we, we need to do something. We never perceive it as an existential question. And that's why, you know, even if we have a superior power position, it's, it's hard to, to um, it's, it's hard to get there. So I think when it comes to deterrence, we need to uh, draw the famous red lines and we need to enforce the red lines. And I mean, what are red lines, you know, using uh, chemical weapons on NATO territory? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's red lines. That's something that we should, um, you know, provide credible deterrence measures against. Uh, lying in general in the information sphere? No. Um, organized um, massive election influence? Um, yes, that's, that's, uh, so I think that we need to first sort it out for ourselves, you know, what's reasonable uh, and, you know, how do we deter? I'm going to give you one example, which I think it's, I think, one of the, maybe the only really, not the only, but one of the most impactful thing I think we've done um, and you've done in the US is the April 2018 sanctions when um, there was actually sanctions on um, some key uh, oligarchs, not only, you know, symbolic figureheads in the, in the administration, but including Oleg Deripaska, 
which among other things crashed the aluminum market um, because he owns Rusal, one of the biggest producers in the world. So what happened then when we actually had effect uh, was not that uh, we said, okay, um, stop doing this or this, or we'd expand this. Actually, we were, we were a bit surprised ourselves that, oh God, uh, we had a lot of effect with our sanctions. And what we said to Deripaska was, we'll take Rusal off the, uh, off the sanctions list if you seize control of it. So what he did was he, he gave it to something like his daughter, um, and then he, you know, the Rusal was taken off the list, and since then there's been no, no sanctions. So I think that that could be a way, um, but, but yet again, we need to understand that deterrence is limited. We need to, you know, use it in, 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 in few instances, but then we need to actually really use it. Uh, as we uh, finish this hour, I think we have time for just a few more questions, uh, if you will. Uh, this, I think, uh, is, is close to home for you. It, it asks the question, what actions are countries bordering Russia taking to counter their influence operations and are any proving to be successful? And, on, and a second question that says, is Russia having success influencing the Swedish population? Mm. Okay, um, very, very wide questions. Okay, what has been successful? Um, I think there's, I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of things that can be done. I think my major criticism to Sweden, which I've voiced in a number of other ways, is very, we often talk very loudly and do very little. You know, we, we say, hey, we're outraged, this is unacceptable, and then we call up the Russian ambassador um, who, you know, his whole job is to make life difficult for us. And then we say, you cannot do this. And he said, and then he said, what do you mean? You do this all the time. Um, that, that's not effective. I'll take one example from Finland or, or two even. You know, when they uh, were the first foreign nation acquiring the JASM from the US, the air to surface missiles, long range, great ones. Um, they released a video of them uh, test shooting it. Um, and the target looked uh, very, very similar to uh, S-400s. They published a video, they didn't say a word, but it was very clear strategic communications. Mm -hmm. And another example also from Finland is that um, there was a suspicious Russian company buying up a lot of property in the Finnish archipelago, close to military installations, digging harbors, building helipads. Um, and then the biggest police operation in Finnish history, security police, police and military, goes around, arrest them, find, you know, five million in cash, uh, find a lot of, you know, bunk beds and other type of things in these places. But yet again, they don't, you know, no angry statements, it's just resolute action. And that's, you know, that's a standing insight that, um, you know, everyone, you know, for all my years spending on trying to understand this and talking with all the experts in the field, there's no, never ever been anyone who said, hey, uh, Russia listens to high shouts and no actions. Like, it's, it's actions and you, you know, um, it's, 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 you know, carry a big stick, I think is a short one. Um, in terms of Sweden, I think that we've done some things, um, working very closely with, with monitoring, lecturing influence, working on digital literacy. Um, but I think that, uh, I think it was Nina Jankovic who just come out with a new book, How to Lose the Information War, um, said that, you know, we have two separate problems. One of that is that kind of our public information space is broken. And the second one is that you have, a, um, that you have an angry actor trying to influence it. The angry actor trying to influence it, that's kind of a deterrence problem, that the public information system is broken. Uh, that's a, you know, that, that's a domestic problem. And I, you know, I cannot solve exactly uh, you know, the, the, the crisis of the media, the, you know, the way that uh, big tech is working, but just, uh, sorry, um, that uh, just take the example that, uh, I mean, Google, um, Google and Facebook are information networks. They are literally making their money on manipulating information uh, networks through advertising. Of course, this is vulnerable, uh, and I don't have a solution for it, but this is the infrastructure through which we access the digital world. Um, you know, that we need to think of in itself. Um, Facebook is classified as a, a platform, not a, not a publisher, so they don't, you know, technically don't have any 
uh, responsibility of what's happening there. So, uh, so yeah, how how they work in Sweden? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll think I'll I think I'll stop there and we'll we'll see if we have more questions. We just have just a couple more, uh, and I think this question goes along with what you've been you've been basically speaking to. Um, as the Russians continue to employ uh, WMD grade weapons and assassinations as part of their their activities, uh, um, in, in terms of our own strategic thinking, what should we be doing? How should we respond to that? Because that that goes along in conjunction with their information piece as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that I think that that that's really it's about you know what are the red lines and and wh when do we you know when do we credibly use our um, you know our deterrence uh, capability, and I think that um, you know we need to think of um, we need to think as any kind of strategy where do we have comparative advantages? If you look at the Russian information domain, it's it's incredibly sealed. It's very difficult to to get there. I mean, if you look at the big, I think the ten biggest. Uh, TV channels, um, you find that they are either state controlled or like uh, Novaya Media Grupa owned by Kovalchuk, which is a pro Kremlin uh, oligarch, um, or Gazprom Media, which is another, you know, you cannot even try to fake it as, as private. Um, so there's enough, um, there's enough critical mass uh, among what the regime controls so they can factor, you can circulate it in all the news. And you give the illusion of, of being true. So, trying to um, you know impact through the media uh, is very bad. The economic sphere, I think, that's one of the most important ones. Not because that you know Russia's you know Russia's goal has ever been the economic development, but a lot of Russian leadership are depending on on getting their money into the West, um, of utilizing open financial systems, um, and or or needing their companies to function on 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 western international financial markets i think that is a key thing to explore and our final question comes from uh, from dr ike wilson who is the president of jsao and he, his his question is a good one how how do matters and factors of values calculate into the russian way so it asks the question what do the russians value and how does that how does that fit in with the way the West, Western values deal with these war and peace issues? Mm. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very good question. And I think that um, this is always, a, this is also like a big debate between the Russia experts to, you know, what is Russia driven of? Is it big nostalgia restoring the Soviet Union? Is it crazy nationalism? Um, is it something else? I think. The short answer, my takeaway is, it's actually um, I, I don't believe in in any of those really. Like, if you look at what Putin is saying about the Soviet Union, he's been quite critical. Um, if you take the statement, which is the most circulated, the one that the the fall the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century. Honestly, I, I don't think anyone has done the attempt to try and understand Russia if they don't agree with that. At the time, the Soviet Union, you know, had control all the way to into the middle of Germany and all of the Balkans and all of Eastern Europe. Of course, it was a geopolitical disaster that that they lost that, you know, overnight. Um, the, that's the, you know, I, I think that that's indisputable. Um, you know, I would challenge anyone to come up with a bigger. Uh, if you also look at the, you know, super conservative nationalist rhetoric, which they say that Putin is a crazy nationalist. Actually, some of his biggest challenges has come from the nationalist camp, and he had been he had been cautious for a long time to try and commit to that. Um, you can look at Sam Green's writings. I think it's very very insightful. He's a sociologist that lived in Russia for a couple of decades. Uh, he's now running King's Russia Institute, uh, and he's researching you know protests and social movements in Russia. Um, so no, I think the, the 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 short answer is that Putin is fundamentally pragmatist, and I think. But I think the values aspect is really important because I think that in conjunction with the color revolutions that the Russians really understood this as a threat because the idea of um, liberal democracy that you should have a, a, you know, the ability to choose your rulers, that you should have a, you know, a market economy and not a state controlled economy. 
they are a big part of the reason why you have these color revolutions where you know some of russia's biggest partners and belarus as we speak now um, are revolting against a system that's very similar to the one in russia so i think it's from a the threat of those values they've seen the need to come come with counter values and other values um, but i also think they are more pragmatic than they are idealistic i see well, Oscar, on, on behalf of uh, Dr. Ike Wilson, uh, our president, thank you uh, for today. Um, well, thank you. It's, it's, this has it's been extraordinary. Pleasure. And it's a pity I haven't been able to, to see all of you. That's normally you know, that's part of the, the, uh, part of the discussion. Reason. I got to see you, Jack, so that's, that's good. That's great. That's great. For feedback on this session or any Think JSAO activity, please contact us at thinkjsau at socom.mil. And I'd like to close by once again encouraging everyone to explore the complete Think JSAO collection by subscribing through the library or on one of the social media channels on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, or APAN. Additionally, the US SOCOM library is an exceptional resource for checking out electronic books or to download past and present JSAO monographs through the JSAO press. You can always check out upcoming courses and events on our website which is www.socom.mil slash JSOU. This series is brought to you by the Department of Strategic Studies of the Joint Special Operations University. Thank you all for watching. Oscar, thank you again.